and welcome to today's webinar, Success with Solventless, How to Leverage Rosin to Attract Customers. My name is Eric Sandy, and I'm the digital editor of Cannabis Business Times. In today's exclusive CBT webinar, Pure Pressure's Eric Vlosky will be teaching us some of the secrets that successful solventless processors employ to power their businesses. We'll be focusing on actionable insights today, so everyone in the audience will be able to take away valuable insights for their business in order to profit from top shelf solventless concentrates. Major topics today are gonna to include strategic solventless SKU selection, material allocation, strain hunting, and more. Today's webinar is intended to be the intermediate follow-up to our previous session in June with Pure Pressure, uh, which you can go back and watch again on CannabisBusinessTimes.com. And whether you're a beginner or you're a bit more advanced in the art and science of solventless extraction, you're going to pick up some great information today. So just a few quick notes before we, we begin. Uh, you'll see on your screen a questions box. Please do type in your questions as the presentation goes on, and uh, we'll try to get to them at the end during a little Q&A period. Uh, also, just note that we will be recording today's uh, both the audio and video presentation and archiving that on CannabisBusinessTimes.com, and we'll be sure to send a link to the archived webinar to all registrants uh, in a few days. So, with that, I'm very pleased to welcome today's presenter, Eric Vlosky. Hey, thank you so much for having me, uh, and I really appreciate everyone who's tuning in today. Got a lot of really good information for you, so... Please, if you have any questions, uh, would love to hear them and answer them at the end, uh, or you can contact us and that information will also be at the end of the presentation. So like Eric said, before we get started here, um, this is meant to be the follow-up webinar to our one in June. So if you're going through some of this and you're finding that maybe some of the context is missing for your level of experience or knowledge with extraction, uh, specifically solventless products, I would highly encourage you to go check out that webinar as the previous one really covers a lot of the ground that beginners uh, and those who are you know, kind of at the starting stages of exploration on this topic will find a lot of value in. So really the focus of today's webinar is how to be successful with Solventless. And my goal is to empower everyone who's tuned in and taking the time to join me today uh, to get some really great information and like Eric had said in the description, you know, actual actionable insights for your business or if you're planning to do a business or even just thinking about doing a business, this should give you the information that you need to make some informed decisions about how solventless and rosin can be leveraged. So let me just make sure, okay, going through my slide. So, just a quick overview about our agenda and who I am. Uh, I am the Director of Marketing and Business Development at Pure Pressure. We are the leading equipment manufacturer in the solventless space, and we're based in Denver, Colorado. I've been there since 2016, and I also am a marketing and brand strategist for Pure Cana Labs, our sister consulting company where we help set people up with training. And today's agenda, first, I'm going to give an overview of Solventless. So for people who tuned into the last one, we're going to recover a little bit of ground just so everyone is on the same you know, field of understanding with what Solventless means and the definitions. And then we're really going to do a deep dive into what SKUs are possible with Solventless and really most importantly, how to think about where a market fit can be found since markets across the United States and internationally are in many different stages of developments with different levels of customers uh, across the spectrum there. Then we're gonna talk about material allocation. So what kind of material you may have access to and how it can be used for various solventless products and the promotion of your products being one of our last topics some of the techniques and ways that successful solventless businesses are marketing their products. And then at the very end, we have a slide just really tying together all of the high level, most important points to take home. So I'd encourage everyone to take notes during the presentation if you care to, or that's your style. If not, you can always go back and watch it again. Just like Eric said, this will be available in a couple different places as well as on our YouTube channel so that you can watch this from start to finish. So to get started, let's define what solventless is and what it is not. A solventless cannabis concentrate 
is one that is made without any solvents. Sounds pretty straightforward, such as butane, CO2, or ethanol. And this extraction method is known as mechanical separation. The goal of a mechanical separation is to isolate and preserve the trichomes intact to be either sold as is or processed into rosin and the various products that can be made with rosin as an oil. So there's a lot of confusion around what a solvent does in the cannabis extraction space. Some people have even said that, well, water is a solvent. That's not true. The water in an ice water hash washing process is actually creating mechanical separation, helping you isolate the trichomes or the fruit of the cannabis plant, if you will. Whereas butane, CO2, ethanol, these other methods, they are actually dissolving the trichomes in the resin. So that's a process of dissolution, not mechanical separation. So we would contend that sifting, ice water hash washing, water is not a solvent in this instance, but butane is because it's dissolving those trichomes. So that's the key difference with all of the different kinds of products that we're going to be talking about today, is that the resin, the cannabinoids, the flavonoids, they're all being captured in a way that doesn't result initially in their dissolution with a solvent. So just a little bit of a lengthy explanation about what solventless is. And then this is the only slide in this entire presentation where I'm going to talk about really much of anything that we do, but everyone should have a clear understanding of what kind of equipment is used to make all of the SKUs that we're about to hop in and that we're about to talk about. So that dry sift and bubble hash, rosin, all of these products, again, we're about to get into a considerable amount of detail on, uh, but there are different pieces of equipment that are used to make them, again, to mechanically separate, to shear those trichomes off of the cannabis plant material that you're using and to capture them. So dry sift, that's when you're using trim, that's when you're using buds or popcorn and you're using screens and agitation to collect it, but the starting material is dry. Whereas with bubble hash or otherwise known as ice water hash, you're using cold water, you're using ice, and you're using agitation often with fresh frozen material, not dried material, though both can be used uh, to detach those trichomes, which are then filtered, graded, and freeze dried. And then lastly, we've got rosin. I have in parentheses all types. Uh, a rosin press is what is used to make all of these post-processed products that you may be familiar with, such as simply hash rosin or rosin vape pens, uh, diamond sauce. All these different textures of rosin that can be produced are all produced with one machine, rosin press, so that you can give yourself a lot of latitude for the different kinds of products that you can make. So all in, not a lot of space requirement here to make solventless products. Uh, the equipment that you would use and purchase to make the SKUs that we're going to talk about is a significantly smaller cost or investment than many of the solvent-based products and equipment that you are used to seeing. Um, also operating in a smaller space, not requiring C1, D1 rooms. Again, we're talking about equipment that does not use flammable solvents, no gases under pressure, a uh, very safe and a very simple method of extraction. But a method of extraction nonetheless that creates many, if not the most expensive, the highest shelf products on the market. So I'm just gonna dive right in and we're gonna get really well acquainted with all of the different SKUs that you can make solventlessly that are popular on the market today. And things are moving so quick with solventless specifically that I wouldn't be surprised if in a follow-up webinar, you know, six months from now, there are multiple additional SKUs that we add to this list. So I've got about three slides and I'm gonna go through each one of these just so that everyone can have a really good idea of some of the products that they either might be used to seeing or some products that they might be interested in bringing to the market themselves based on what the competitor availability looks like and what else is out there. So this slide, we're really focusing on rosin. And while we do not cover every single texture of rosin that can be made, these are the most popular rosin SKUs 
on the market right now. And the number one most popular SKU that you're gonna see in many dispensaries is ice water hash rosin, typically live rosin made with a fresh frozen material, meaning that it's been live. And these retail for anywhere from 40 to $100 a gram. I would say on average, you're looking more at uh, 50, 60 and above. Um, 70 to $80 a gram is common for the real top shelf products. This is a connoisseur grade concentrate that builds brands and loyal buyers. Uh, as far as solventless products go, there's not a ton of data that's being aggregated across the different markets that I could say that, you know, I have the data that says this is the number one top sold rosin product. But anecdotally, working with our customers in the industry we do, I feel really confident saying that this is the number one solventless product. And then to the right of that, you've got something that's perhaps even more intriguing to people that are tuning in, which is a hash rosin vape cartridge. Uh, these are the premier vape cartridges on the market, hands down. I can say that confidently as well. These run anywhere from 50 to $80 a half gram. They are made with 100% rosin, no cuts, no fillers, no additives. And this is really the ultimate cannabis product for multiple consumer types. And as we're going to get into, lay consumers and people who are not into dabbable concentrates, especially those that are willing to pay a higher price point for a premium product, this is the product that is going to get them in the door. Uh, but it does require quite a bit of mastery of the ice water hash process and some other prerequisites. Uh, this is a very hot product that you're seeing a lot of companies invest a lot of time and money into developing and bringing to the market. And then you've got things like dry sift rosin and flower rosin, which are both very popular, uh, but not quite as popular right now as ice water hash rosin. Dry sift rosin is a step up from flower rosin, and there are some producers out there in the market, although there aren't very many, that make dry sift rosins that are equally good as the highest shelf ice water hash rosins. Uh, but the technology there, hasn't quite been able to scale in the way that the ice water hash uh, equipment technology is right now. And then we've got flower rosin, which is going to be the entry level rosin product that a lot of customers are gonna find a lot of interest in. This is really the easiest rosin to make because all you have to do is put flour into a rosin press and squish it, kind of like making fresh juice. I mean, it really is that simple. Um, typically the clarity is a little bit reduced compared to an ice water hash or a dry sift rosin, uh, and it retails for a lower price point. But again, this is a very popular product depending on where you're at in the market, and it's very easy to create. And then we've got hash and sift. So like we were talking about before, the rosin press is the tool that is used to make a lot of these different textures and these you know, final expressions of the cannabis plant. But also hash and sift are really making a comeback. And a lot of people who've tuned in are probably familiar with, you know, old world style hand pressed hash, maybe even full melt or six star, which is what I'll start with here. And that really is the ultimate product for hash connoisseurs. Uh, this is a ritual. This is a product that is the, this is the finest fruit that the cannabis plant can offer. And it's called full melt because when you dab it, it should leave no residue on the nail. Uh, this is a product that requires only the highest quality cannabis to produce. Otherwise, you might make more of a four or six star or four or five star, excuse me. And then you've got Keef or Sift. Uh, many people who are tuning in are probably familiar with this. They might have Keef at the bottom of their grinder. Um, they might add that as a bowl topper. This is something that can be produced on a commercial scale with trim and all kinds of other products. Uh, this is a potency enhancer, typically enjoyed with flour and is often a pretty budget friendly product. Uh, and then we've got full spectrum ice water hash, which is essentially one, just one step down from full melt ice water hash. Uh, it's multiple microns, different sizes of those trichome heads that are mixed together. Um, they come in a couple different quality ratings uh, and those retail anywhere from around 30 to $50 a gram. There are some really great full spectrum ice water hashes on the market. And that's a product that is starting to make a comeback. It was popular for a long time. I'm sure many people are familiar with bubble hash. That is what this is. And then in the bottom right corner, we've got hand pressed hash, a product we're really excited to start seeing come back because this is the old world Moroccan hash, the old world style of hash. 
Although Frenchie Cannoli and some of the other hash makers out there might uh, dispute some of that with me. But for our purposes, this is what a lot of people are used to seeing as the bubble hash that they used to enjoy. Now it's being hand pressed into bricks and it's also used as a bowl topper, uh, typically a very hashy flavor, something that appeals to some of the older cannabis consumers. And I think there's a lot of them out there that have been around and are looking for this throwback product that they used to experience uh, in, in the market, you know, long before anything was medical, recreational, or legal at all. And then finally, we've got edibles and more. So this is really kind of the biggest new frontier for solventless, is that topicals and tinctures are among the top sold ones in California, and you can see Papa and Barkley there. Uh, really premium full spectrum, and full spectrum is a term that I believe is probably the most abused marketing term in cannabis right now, but these are true full spectrum products. You're not getting one tiny nanogram of flavonoids in here. You're, you're getting an actual product that contains multiple cannabinoids and flavonoids. They have a nice little premium retail price point, and the same goes for solventless edibles. People are really starting to find that they can carve a niche for themselves by creating edibles that are made with solventless oils uh because again they are full spectrum they retail for more and they give you a little bit more of a multi-dimensional experience as opposed to many of the distillate and co2 based edibles which are very narrow in the band of cannabinoids that they happen to contain and then lastly we've got hash infused pre-rolls uh there's also canagars that use solventless hash um, and these are very, very popular right now. You know, you can see our ranking data source headset. Um, we've seen things as high as the number two or three pre-roll in Colorado. Many of the products that I've talked about kind of bounce around in some of these rankings. But you can go to headset and look at their sales data and see where those rankings are at. But you'll find, and many people are surprised to see, that a lot of solventless products are gaining a ton of ground in terms of popularity as of late as customers really start to wake up to the quality that is inherent with a solventless product. Uh, hash infused pre-rolls, great way to differentiate your pre-rolls, sprinkle a little ice water hash, bubble hash, or keef in there. Um, it really brings them up not only in potency, but also in flavor. Uh, again, differentiator, slight price increase, um, definitely a high-end pre-roll offering that sets a competitive distinction. So now that we understand what kinds of SKUs that solventless can make, it's time to start talking about what types of customers are out there and what does, you know, as I call it, the consumer type funnel. And I've got some questions on the left and I'll get to those in just a second. But at the top of the funnel, you're gonna have the lay consumer, someone who is not very familiar with cannabis, or if they are, they're really not that interested in smoking or vaping, let alone taking a dab. And the further down the funnel you get, you're gonna have different levels and increasing aficionado-ness. Not quite a word, but I'm just gonna make that up. Um, so you got topicals, balms, and tinctures, and then you go down, and then you're gonna probably start finding people that are more interested in you know, edibles, a stronger experience, actually potentially getting high, using CBD, as a mixture in here, um, rosin vape pens and keef. And then as you get further down the funnel, that's when you start getting into the dabable concentrates such as flower rosin, hand pressed hash, uh, you know, sift rosin. I couldn't decide if it should be on the second, third or fourth level, but I think it's pretty well situated. And then again, rosin vape pens, those are in two categories because you're gonna find that people in the middle band of the consumer funnel Many of them are gonna be interested in vape pens uh, regardless, but then at the bottom of the list, your true connoisseurs, their true aficionados, chances are they're really gonna be more looking at that full melt hash, hash rosin and a premium sift rosin uh, as the product that they're looking for. So you really need to ask yourself a couple questions and we're gonna get into the market aspect of this in the next couple slides, but you really need to understand and be honest with yourself how mature is your market? Because as markets are brand new, the exuberance around flour is so high that some customers, you know, aren't really looking for very expensive dabable concentrates. 
they don't really understand why they would want to pay that money anyway. They can buy flour and it's great and it's great quality. So if you've got a more mature market that you're sitting in, like California or Colorado or even now Nevada and Washington and Oregon, those markets are really starting to pick up a ton of steam with Solventless because customers are demanding new experiences. So the maturity of your market can have a lot to do with what types of SKUs you're going to offer. Again, we're going to get into this in a lot of detail. And then what are your competitors selling? You know, it's really important to understand who out there is selling what, how many of your competitors are selling Solventless and what are they selling? And then the second question under that, third question, what products are you not seeing at the local dispensary level that you could potentially fill a niche with? You know, is hand-pressed hash not even a product that exists in your market that's being marketed or sold? Well, that could be something that you could pursue. Um, and then lastly, you know, how much education are you providing around your products? Do you have a website where you actually talk about them, how you produce them? This is something at the end of the presentation I'm going to get into a considerable amount of detail on. We're going to talk about how to market your products. Uh, but these are all really important questions to be asking yourself, you know, as we go through this presentation and as you try and decide how you want to pursue solventless. So SKUs and market fit, just getting into this a little bit more, you know, it's really important to have a product strategy and to really do that research about what your competitors are doing. Are hash infused pre-rolls a popular part of product in your market or are they something you're not seeing much of? You know, how about hash rosin? Is the hash rosin out there really proliferating in your market? What's the quality like? You know, I would encourage anyone who's here to be a student of the game, go to dispensaries, purchase products, look at packaging, you know, to really get in at the ground level and to see what your competitors are doing is one of the most important things that you can do for your business. Um, and like I said in the previous slide, you know, you're going to have in less mature markets, more customers clustering at the top end of the cannabis consumer funnel that I had described in the last slide. And then conversely, more mature markets will have more connoisseurs focused on dabable concentrates, high end products, top shelf SKUs. So based on where you're at, where you expect your market to go, are you in a medical market that might be going recreational soon? Do you want to get ahead of this trend and attract those consumers early? Or are you in a mature market or, or a market that's maturing quickly, such as Arizona, where they're already just a medical market, but Solventless is one of the top sold top shelf products down there? Again, that competitor research, really understanding what SKUs are popular, that's going to go the distance for you. So here's just kind of a matrix, and I'll admit that I tried hard to make this slide intuitive, but I don't think it came out quite the way that I wanted it to, but hopefully it gives everyone an idea of taking that concept of the cannabis consumer funnel one step further with just an idea of what retail costs look like, higher or lower versus lay consumers against aficionados or connoisseurs. So one thing that you're going to see and what's going to stand out immediately is in that top left quadrant, uh, the 100% rosin cartridge. Those are a higher retail cost, but they do appeal to a more lay consumer potentially than, for example, your full melt ice water hash, which, let's just face it, a lot of customers out there aren't going to pay for that because they don't even know how to consume it. They don't even know what it is. So you've got premium hash or sift rosin. I'm not going to go through every single one of these SKUs, um, but this is a great one to screenshot. This is a great one to revisit when the webinar gets posted afterwards. Uh, usually it's around a week or so when we get it up for you to revisit. Um, but this gives you a really good idea of where price points are at for these various products and what consumers expect to pay for them versus what kinds of consumers will actually be interested in these kinds of products. Now, not every single one of these fits neatly into the box. Uh, you know, you might have some more lay consumers that are just as interested in hand pressed brick hash as they are, you know, flour rosin or keeper sift. So there is some flexibility here, uh, but this is the best stab at kind of showing everyone, you know, what these price points look like versus which kinds of consumers are actually going to be going after them. So now let's talk about material and material allocation. Um, I've got a lot of slides in this presentation. I'm really trying to 
give you guys a ton of information. So if I'm moving a little fast, you know, try to keep up with me here. And again, you can always revisit all of this and make sure to ask some questions. Um, what kinds of material can you grow? And what types of material can you purchase? Um, when we're talking about material allocation and the types of cannabis that you need to have to produce these SKUs of any of the solventless varieties, you really need to look at what is your plan for acquiring material. Are you vertically integrated and you're growing all of your own, in which case you have a ton of control, or at least you should have some control over what you're growing and the direction of your grow? Or are you purchasing material and forging relationships with growers and wholesalers so that you are getting material that is good for solventless? And many businesses might do both of these and there's effective paths to create really great solventless SKUs in either direction. Um, I would say that if you have a great grow, that's often your best bet to be able to have more control over the material that's coming into your lab. Sounds pretty obvious, uh, but also there's a lot of work involved with that. You have to have a grow that's aligned with what your extraction goals are. And often grows are gonna have multiple aims that the owners of the business are asking for. Hey, we need really great flour to sell our top shelf flour, but we also need some of that to go to solventless. But what's our mid shelf product gonna do? Are we just gonna turn it into hydrocarbon? Or are we gonna sell it as a lesser quality product? There's a lot of options there. And same for purchasing material. Um, there's many successful businesses out there that really pride themselves on going out and sourcing a bunch of new material. They're always talking with growers, they're always bringing in new flavors, and they build up a strong brand following by taking a keen eye towards bringing new flavors and new strains that other growers and other outfits are producing that then they are bringing to market from processing. Also really great macro shots here throughout the presentation. Uh, Eric Nug shots, you can find him online. I'll plug him at the very end, uh, but if you need any cannabis macro photography, he's the guy. So just some ideas about starting material. Solventless is really gonna tell you the truth, uh, for lack of a better term. And it's really important for everyone who's listening that you need to be honest with yourself, and I said this before, concerning your material and how important that is to your SKU selection. Everyone out there wants to say that they grow a premium cannabis. And everyone out there says, I make top shelf products. But if you really don't have top shelf cannabis, and I, and I mean that, top shelf, like cannabis that would easily pass for top shelf in a dispensary, chances are that material's not gonna be good enough to make a full melt ice water hash. Or it might not be good enough to make a really top quality hash rosin because the best producers that are making these $80 a gram $70 a gram hash and sift rosins, they are taking their finest, finest material, their finest cannabis buds, and then processing those. They're not taking the leftovers. They are growing the best cannabis or sourcing the best cannabis that they possibly can to make these concentrates, which is a little bit of a hard thing for some people in newer markets to kind of wrap their brain around, but that they're farming the resin, not just going for the flour. Whereas if you've got trim, popcorn, lower or mid-range starting material, that's great too. There's a lot that you can do with that because you can use that for food grade rosin to be made into edibles, topicals, tinctures. You do not have to have a bud that has the highest shelf appeal to make your edibles. There are companies that do that and they make some of the best edibles perhaps in the entire world. But if you're sitting there and you're thinking like, hey, my grow's pretty good or my source of material is good, but maybe it's not full melt or ultra premium hash rosin good, you still have a lot of options out there. And it's also important to note that in these newer markets, customers, many of them haven't quite been exposed to you know, what, the, what the pinnacle of these top products look like in California and Colorado and some of the mature markets. So you have a little bit more flexibility, a little bit bigger of a margin uh, to introduce some of those. So again, just be honest with yourself about the material you have access to, and then plug that into what kinds of SKUs could make sense uh, for you. So this is probably 
one of the most important slides uh, in this presentation. And I would highly encourage everyone who is you know, listening in right now to really take note of a couple things that I'm about to say, because when it comes to solventless processing, what you're gonna find is that not every strain is gonna yield the way that it needs to yield for you to be profitable with that product. And it's important to be upfront with the fact that even if something looks absolutely knockout incredible on the shelf, it may not produce the way that it needs to, again, for you to be profitable with it in your lab. So finding the right genetics to actually pursue and the, and the strains that your grow can produce or the strains and the flavors that your wholesale partners can actually sell to you is critically important. Anecdotally, we're finding that around a third of cannabis strains out there are very suitable for cannabis processing because when you're performing the mechanical separation to kind of go back to the beginning of the presentation, if there's not a lot of juice to squeeze, you're not gonna get a lot of juice. If there's not a lot of resin, you're not gonna be as successful. Whereas if you've got a strain such as, I mean, pick any strain out of the bag. If you run it through a hydrocarbon setup or a CO2 setup, for example, it's just gonna dissolve and recapture most of whatever cannabinoids and resin were present in the plant material. But with a solventless process, you're gonna find that your strain selection is probably, if not the most important part of determining which strains you wanna run and which strains that really are gonna make sense for you to pursue in your business. So we've got some popular lineages here and these are pretty broad. Um, chem strains, I mean, I can't imagine what the count would be, but there's there gotta be hundreds of them. But with that being said, you know, chem dog, tray chem, there's so many of these chem strains in that lineage that produce super well for solventless because they're really heavy resin producers. They produce large trichomes and the trichomes in many cases for a lot of these phenotypes are pretty easy to detach. So what I'm gonna recommend to everyone here, if you did not catch our first webinar, is to go back right around to around the middle of that webinar and really check out the in-depth explanations I was offering around how to understand trichomes that work well for solventless processing. Uh, not quite enough room in this presentation to go back through every single detail on that, but there's some really great information in that deck around trichome detachability. What does that even mean? You know, sizes and types of trichomes. You know, there's a lot there that is worth looking into. And I, you know, there's a long in-depth explanation about that. So going down the list, we don't have to go through every single one of these strains, but what you're gonna find out is that, especially with GMO, Mac, uh, cookie, strain, cookie strains, excuse me, cake strains, um, those are some of the most popular strains that high level hash makers are putting out there today. And I would tell everyone who is listening to this that go out and find hash makers to follow, find grows to follow on Instagram. It's really where this community lives and breathes because they are excited to share what strains they're growing, what strains they're producing, you know, what's working for them. Um, so it's a great way to get an idea and some insights into what kinds of strains are being produced and what the next wave looks like so that your business can be a trendsetter just like many of these super successful solventless businesses out in California. So, you know, I've been kind of preaching it the whole time, you know, really know your competitors to anyone that's been in business a long time. They're going to say, yeah, yeah, you know, of course I know that, but how you view your competitors and how you find out what other people and your peers in your space are doing is a little bit less straightforward in cannabis than it might be in other industries. You're really looking to spend a lot of your time on Instagram, whether or not you want to do that. But that's where a lot of this community exists. And that's where you're going to see a lot of companies saying, we're really excited about our wedding cake hash rosin and our papaya our pie and all of these other strains out there. They're going to be talking about that 
And it's important then to link up with your grow, to link up with your wholesalers and say, what kind of strains do you have available or that we could pursue so that we can go ahead and start knocking out some of these great strains that are super profitable that we can make good money on. As an example of kind of the wide spectrum here and why I would encourage anyone to either do a small test batch or otherwise, you know, test material before committing to major batches of it, whether you grow it yourself, you purchase it. We had a customer who ran some tangy through their brutalist ice water hash washing system, came out the other end, did the math and found out that their cost to produce each gram of that hash rosin was about $135. Now that is an incredibly high price point that they knew they were never gonna be profitable with. But what they did is they only ran around 500 grams fresh frozen, figured that out, and then sold all of that material at the dispensary in dry flower form. On another strain, they ran the ice cream cake, one of a couple cuts that are available of that strain, and found out their cost to produce that hash rosin was closer to $18 a gram, which then they were able to easily wholesale for 35 or more, and that they were able to sell at a retail price point of around 65 to $70 a gram. So I just wanted to give everyone an idea of how there's so much variability in what genetics can produce in solventless that it's important to really key in on which strains you're producing, have they been tested for solventless, and then pursuing strains and lineages uh, that are gonna be profitable for your business. All right, now as kind of the last chunk of our presentation here, I'd really like to talk about brand perception and marketing. This is what I went to school for. Uh, I have a BS in advertising um, and media. So this is a topic that I feel like I can offer a lot of great information for everyone on because this is kind of what I've been eating, sleeping, breathing uh, the last eight years of my career. And it's what I do for peer pressure too. So. If your extraction or processing operation is not producing solventless products, it will struggle to be perceived as a premium brand in today's market. Uh, there are some extremely high tier hydrocarbon only brands out there that you know many customers will call premium. But for the most part, with the evolving landscape of what your brand will be perceived by, if some portion of your SKU lineup is not dedicated to solventless, you might think you've got a premium brand because you love your company and you love your brand, but there's a good chance a lot of consumers in your market, especially as markets mature, will not see it that way. They might see that you've got great products, but if they're looking for a solventless product and you don't offer it, they're gonna look elsewhere. You're already out of the race. So that the perception of your brand and your brand story is so important in the competition in the cannabis space that you really, in many ways, need to get ahead of offering solventless products so that if you're pursuing a premium brand look, this is something that you're really gonna wanna seriously investigate. And then assuming that you've gotten this far through the presentation and you're thinking, hey, solventless sounds pretty darn cool, I'm pretty interested in this, thinking in your head, you know, how can I make this work or what's the best way to potentially implement solventless? The promotion and marketing aspect of this is just as important as all of the rest. And you really need to focus on education. That's the biggest takeaway that I would give to everyone listening in. And it's how educated are the bud tenders at your dispensaries, if you own dispensaries, that is, or the dispensaries that you're being sold in. You could have the best product in that entire dispensary. But if the bud tender doesn't know why your hash rosin costs $60 a gram and the quality that goes behind it, they might not be selling it nearly as effectively as they could be. So education at the dispensary level is one of, if not the most important ways to make sure that your products are actually being moved. Because when you've got customers who are seeing some of the higher price points that Solventless typically commands, they're wondering, well, why would I pay that extra? Especially if they're unfamiliar with it. And that's where really being linked up with the dispensaries 
And again, the bud tenders, your actual salesmen at the ground floor, what are they saying about your products? What do they know? And do you have a firm social media strategy? There's a lot of people out there that they do social media just to do it because they know they have to. But social media and especially Instagram is where the cannabis community really lives. That is where the core community spends their time. That is where they feel safe. They are not posting their high-end exotic products on Facebook. Some of them are, but that's really because their marketing person is saying, hey, we need to be on Facebook too. The real core people are on social media and that's where they're sharing the products they love. They're sharing the experiences with the products that they love. And you need to really think about what are you actually trying to accomplish on social media? That is a whole presentation in and of itself. So I apologize if you're looking for a little bit more depth on that. We're gonna show some specific examples in the coming slides about how you can leverage social media, but really give social media the thought that it deserves. Don't just post any old thing. Quality over quantity is critical there. And it, you know, to dovetail off of that, what does your digital presence look like? And are you focused on education on your website? Is your website look good? Is it something that behooves your brand that when people see it say, oh, this hash rosin, the sift rosin, these rosin edibles, they're great. Why can't I find this company's website? Why doesn't this company's website even tell me how they're made or what they do? So having a digital presence that reinforces the quality of your products really is mandatory. And there's no better way to ensure that a potentially interested customer who is building themselves up to being a brand loyalist when they go online and they can't find anything about you or how you produce your products or why your business is special, what's your story, you're already losing ground. So can't stress it enough. Anyone who's in here who's familiar with marketing and branding, this is all going to be stuff that is kind of, duh, of course, this is what I do or this is what we're doing. But a lot of cannabis business owners, a lot of cannabis business people they can be often very passionate about their products, about their plants, about their grows, but they kind of neglect the branding and the marketing aspect of what they're actually doing with their business. So can't stress it enough. These are all critically important things. You got to be able to take your products you know, to the end zone with great marketing and great education. So to go through a couple examples of what this looks like, um, I've got two slides here of some real world examples that I would encourage everyone to pursue and to think about, about how to market their solventless products. You need to invest in your media. And as you've seen throughout this presentation, these really nice, high quality macro photographs, these are one of the easiest ways to get shares, to get people seeing the quality of your products. And while they don't come cheap, they don't come quite as expensive as you might expect either. Um, they're definitely a great investment to promote your solvent list. And it's not that you maybe need to make time and budget to macro photograph every single strain that you're putting out there, but just to have some of that can be leveraged across your social media. It can be leveraged across um, you know, presentations. I'm showing you guys right now. There's so many different ways that you can use this really great photography and this great media. Um, and then also educating your audience. You know, I would tell everyone out there, go and follow 710 Labs. They really are one of the premier hash makers. They're located in California and Colorado. Uh, that's where they have most of their operations, I believe. I'm not sure if they're in any other states right now. But they're famous not only for their hash, but also their extremely informative posts. You know, if you're really looking to learn a lot more about hash in general, um, you know, there's a lot of good education sources out there, but you want to build your brand into being one that is also offering these levels of education because 710, you can't quite see it in this. I apologize that, you know, the text might be a little small in your end, depending on what kind of screen that you have, but you could go look. This is one of their most recent posts, and it talks a lot about how hash greases up and how it changed, how it changes textures. This is specifically talking about ice water ash, but these are great informative posts actually offering that depth of information in social media is what a lot of customers are really, really looking for. And it's not that hard to do. You know, if you as the business owner 
who may be listening now or prospective business owner, if this really isn't your strong suit, it's not where you feel the most educated, talk to your hash maker, talk to your grower, have them help you get the information that you need to build a highly informative brand. Uh, you know, if you've got the right team behind you, this should not be too difficult of information to acquire. And then one more slide, how to promote yourself continued. Um, tell your story. This is a post that was made on Noku Labs Instagram recently. Uh, they're one of our, they're up here in Fort Collins in Colorado. Uh, really kind of great Cinderella story of a company that went into this wanting to only do solventless, you know, bought our equipment and our consulting and now is winning awards for their products. And they're showing here, you know, that really soil to oil or farm to nail for dabbable concentrate, you know, showing the story of the material. There really is an endless appetite for the journey of the cannabis plant to wherever it's going, whether it's simply being, you know, rolled into a joint or in this case where it's being turned into hash and then ultimately hash rosin, you know, it's really cool to show that chain of creation. Um, a lot of customers are very interested in that. They want to show it. They want to see it. They want to know what's going on. And then the last portion I have here on the right, uh, Happy Cabbage, their uh, producer, their processor up in Oregon. Uh, they make great hash. They make great hash rosin. They make rosin pens. Um, and they have these flyers in a lot of dispensaries where they educate customers about how their hash is made and why it's so special. So just like I was talking about before, you know, that customer level education, that bud tender education, you know, if you can't get in to every single dispensary you're selling your products at and actually sit down and talk with those bud tenders, that's a large investment of time and resources. You can also come up with a flyer. Uh, there's all kinds of other ways that you can get some educational material into the hands uh, of the prospective customers and bud tenders that you might be talking to. Um, this is just an excerpt of it. They kind of show the whole thing in the actual flyer. But the Northwest is one of those markets where until relatively recently, solventless hash rosin was a niche high-end product, a little bit of a higher price point than some people were looking for. But now, according to the data that's coming out of Oregon, you're finding that this market segment with solventless is absolutely taking off because now connoisseurs are really starting to understand why solventless is so great because it's such high quality starting material you cannot remediate any kinds of issues with it this is the highest quality material that companies are working with and processing okay that's something i'm interested in so four good examples of how to promote yourself how to really educate your customers and how to tell your story uh, these are all great avenues to employ so that your business can really get itself out there and talk to people the way that you should be. So here's my last slide before we get into it. I'm sure everyone is uh, getting tired of hearing me talk. Really to tie this all together, I've got three major takeaways for everyone and one more awesome cannabis macro here. Um, the biggest advice that I could give everyone, and this is advice that comes from the top hash makers that I know and have personally spoken with and interviewed, cultivating strong relationships with growers, if you're not vertically integrated, or if you are, work as closely as possible with your grow to develop the right material. You know, it, it's not just paying lip service to the cultivators. They really are the ones that are giving us the tools and the material that we need to make these premium quality products. So cultivating those relationships with growers is what you need to do to be successful with solventless. I, I really cannot stress that enough. That is one of probably the most important part of running a uh, very successful solventless business is just making sure that you have the access to the material that you need to be successful. Um, working with grows, again, you know, I could go on and on and on about that, but that is probably your number one takeaway. The number two one is pursuing SKUs that make sense for your market and your customers' desires based on what is achievable with the material that you have access to. So putting that to putting two and two together there, you know, if, if you know and you're being honest with yourself that like, hey, I don't quite have the best material 
but this sounds like a great product because I don't see any solventless edibles in my market or my locality. Well, that's okay. You still have room to grow. You can still implement them. Maybe look at doing a food grade oil. Or if you're going out and you know that you can grow, you've got a lot of confidence in your grow team or that you can source the material, go for that hash rosin, go for that rosin vape pen. These are the products that build brands and make them famous with consumers because of their quality. Um, there's almost too many examples to count, but a lot of businesses out there have taken that exact mantra and are now expanding you know, all across different states, all across their own states. Um, you need to pursue the SKUs that make sense for your market and for you. And then lastly, you know, really put the time and the effort in to properly market your solventless products through education, social media, and butt tender education appreciation. You know, you could come up with the best solventless product in your entire state. And if you're not really putting it out there in a way that people can find it, that they can understand it, that they can appreciate it, your sell-through rates are going to be a lot lower than you want, just expecting it to sell itself. And eventually, a lot of these products do sell themselves. Once they've built up the audience, they've built up the followers, you have the connoisseurs and influencers on your side, and they're ready to talk about you. But until you hit that critical mass where every time you do a drop, you're sold out in advance. There's people waiting for your product that sells out in a couple days. It's really important to put that effort in to properly market your solventless products. And again, you know, go back through some of those examples, tried and true, not terribly difficult to implement, but all of this takes effort. All of this takes time, but your customers will thank you. The market will reward you for coming up with these products and doing it the right way. So that's my presentation. Uh, we've got right around eight minutes, I believe. I came in two minutes over on this. So I would love to answer any questions anyone's got and then, you know, let everyone get on with the rest of their day. So thank you all so much for tuning in. I really appreciate you taking the time to sit down with me. Excellent. <clears throat> well, yes, Eric, thank you for that presentation. That was fantastic. And um, we've got a few questions here I want to hit on. Uh, real quick, I do want to remind everyone that our June webinar uh, with Pure Pressure is available on Pure Pressure's YouTube channel, and that's Go Pure Pressure, as well as on CannabisBusinessTimes.com. And of course, this current webinar will be up in those places shortly. Uh, so this information is available for review. Um, wanted to start with a question here that goes back to uh, material allocation and um, some of those uh, vertical integration versus outside sourcing questions we were talking about earlier. Um, could you maybe get into uh, indoor versus outdoor? And uh, when you're looking for top shelf flour, uh, does that come into the equation? Yeah, excellent question. One of many topics I struggled with considering squeezing in or not. You can make a great solventless product with indoor out or outdoor. I've found that often in... <sighs> It's, it's a hard one to answer because I personally am not the person working in the lab all day. But what I hear more than anything is that you can be successful with both, but that with outdoor material, you really need to make sure that the environment that which it was grown in, whether it's greenhouse or, you know, straight actual outdoor, you know, what are those trichomes looking like? And one of the best pieces of advice I got, um, I think it was from Matt at Grow Sciences. He's their co-founder and COO, huge successful operation in Arizona. They're expanding rapidly. They do all of theirs indoor because it's Arizona. They're out there with jewelers loops and magnifying glasses looking at the trichomes and seeing what they look like. So if you're if the question is simply, you know, can I be successful with either or should I do one or the other? You can be successful with either, but you have to be just as scrupulous with your indoor as well as your outdoor, but probably especially your outdoor, uh, what kind of material you're sourcing. So hopefully that answers the question, a little long-winded, um, but feel free to contact us for any of these questions. If you didn't quite get what you were looking for, uh, we'd love to get on the phone and you know answer this in even more detail than that. Absolutely, yes. Please do jot down the, uh, the contact info there. Um, Eric, we have another question, uh, sort of similar, I suppose. 
relating to um, drying and curing techniques. And, and of course, some, some of these folks may be vertically integrated, others may be working with growers to source material, but um, could you talk a bit about any considerations or questions that might need to be asked with regard to uh, curing especially, but also drying? Yeah, so before I do that, before I really give you the answer on curing, what's important to know is that for the ice water hash process, which is the process that really produces the vast majority of these really, really high-end SKUs, um, people are using fresh frozen cannabis. So that's something that a lot of businesses, especially in newer markets, kind of need to wrap their heads around is that if you want to make a premium hash rosin, you're going to be working with fresh frozen material, not dried or cured material, uh, because it creates that live product. But in the curing process, if you're dealing with dried material, which you can still absolutely use and use for many different applications in solventless, you know, how well is the cure being done? Because everyone is probably familiar with a poorly cured cannabis and it smells like hay. Well, guess what? Your hash is going to smell like hay too. Your edibles might have a little hint of that so that, you know, I, I'm not the expert on the curing or growing side of things. I've grown myself. And I will say that personally, curing might be the hardest part of the process to do properly, at least here in Colorado, it's so dry. Um, but really, you want to make sure that you're getting that slow, long cure to preserve as many of the flavonoids and terpenes as possible. Because whatever you're starting out with when you've got your dried cured cannabis, that's what you're working with. So sounds obvious. But if the cure was not done very well, then chances are you're going to have a reduction in quality of your end product. Sure. Um, we have a, another question relating to uh, next steps, as it were, uh, for a, a business interested in in doing trials or some, some R and D with with solventless techniques, what's a helpful way to to start working with this process, keeping costs low while in, in sort of a trial period? Uh, would, would that involve using perhaps less lower quality flour and creating those uh, um, you know tinctures or topicals, or would it be helpful to just sort of get the ball rolling with a trial with higher quality products? Yeah, I mean. That is really depending on what you want to achieve with solventless. And if your goal with solventless is to make a high-end hash rosin, well, if you're going to start with your lower quality buds and see if you can get what you want from there, I'm sorry to say that you're not going to be very successful with that. Whereas if you're just kind of dipping your toes in the water and you're thinking like solventless could be a really good thing for a business, but I'm not sure where to start. The best advice I would have is to just talk to one of our solventless experts and they're going to talk you through exactly what kinds of constraints what your market is i mean they really understand what things look like and can help you get started either with a small setup um, or helping you get an equipment list that makes sense to really get off the ground successfully so you know that question ultimately goes back to what kinds of skews you think might be successful for your business and your market, which is something that we can absolutely help you identify. Uh, but you know, if you want to go for gold, you got to use gold material, no matter what you're trying to do and no matter how little you're testing or trying, but all things that we can absolutely talk you through and help you out with. Fantastic. Uh, Eric, well, I want to say thank you uh, to you for that presentation and of course to the whole Pure Pressure team uh, for the information here. This was a fantastic uh, presentation today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Uh, and I look forward to getting this up. If anyone tuned in late, or if you know you got distracted at part of it, you want to go back to it. So make sure to check out the recap uh, if you did not get everything you were looking for. Most definitely, yes. That recap is uh, coming shortly. And again, once more, a reminder that uh, this is sort of following our June webinar available over at Pure Pressure's YouTube channel, that's Go Pure Pressure, as well as CannabisBusinessTimes.com. Um, so until we meet again, thank you to everyone who attended and have a fantastic day.